So in my last video about Linux, you should check it out if you haven't seen it. At the end of the video, I said, Leave a like if you want me to try Arch. And for a pretty small channel, that video currently sits at about 8,000 views and almost 500 likes. So that's literally about 5% of people that watch the video hit the like button. If only they did that with a subscribe button. Please subscribe. So Arch Linux is a minimalist distribution of Linux designed for users who want full control over their operating system. It's best for experienced users, developers, and people who like tinkering. It is definitely not ideal or recommended for beginners who want a ready to use operating system with minimal setup. It is infamously known for being difficult to set up compared to other operating systems. It's also probably the most memed operating system ever. I use Arch, by the way, being a very well-known meme in the tech space. There's even merch you can get. So I said I would try it and I'm gonna own it. So today we're gonna be trying Arch Linux for the first time as a Windows user of 15 years. So like before, the first step of installing any operating system, go to that official page and download the .iso file. In Arch Linux's case, the download page is quite indicative of how the experience is going to go. There's no one big download button. Uh, instead, you have to kind of find what you're looking for. Scroll past the many alternative downloading options such as torrenting, Windows subsystem, uh, and you want just HTTP direct download. Scroll down a little more and then click the link either from the worldwide section or whichever location is closest to you. I think it's just, it's just server location. I just went with worldwide and it worked fine. You're then met with about 12 options. Don't get confused, for most people who made it this far, the correct option is almost always the plain file that ends in just .iso. Click that and it will download. Once you have your ISO file, the next step is flashing a USB with that file. You can do this with a few programs, most popular of which is Belina Etcher, which is more simple. It's kind of two to three clicks and then you're done. Or you can use Rufus, which is more advanced, gives you a lot more options. One note about Rufus, like, thought was interesting is if you're going the other way and you're installing Windows, Rufus lets you disable the TPM requirements for Windows 11 and, and you can even force a local account. So highly recommend Rufus. I just went with Belina Etcher mainly because it was already installed from my last video. It was very simple. It lays it out for you in three steps. Number one, select the ISO file you downloaded. Number two, you plug in a USB. Keep in mind, all data on the USB will get erased, so make sure nothing important is on there. I'm also not really sure what the requirements for the USB are, but I used uh, this eight gigabyte USB 2.0 drive. It was just meant for photo storage uh, and it worked fine. So that's a pretty low bar to set. Click the big flash button and wait for it to finish. My drive took a few minutes, but yours could be faster. Next step is to restart your computer and you wanna boot directly into that drive. So you wanna access your BIOS or your boot menu settings to boot directly into that drive. Important note I learned from my last video is that you always wanna make sure you're booting from UEFI because older motherboards like mine might have a legacy boot option which won't really work properly. Once you boot into the drive, on other operating systems when you're normally met with a splash screen or like a live USB arch, nothing and just greets you with a command line interface or a CLI. Basically here, I had to set up the partitions myself as I was dual booting. Oh, there's an ambulance. All right, I was dual booting, which as some of you pointed out in my last video is not the best option, but I feel like a lot of other people that are interested in trying Linux would also probably try dual booting as their options instead of going straight out to buy another drive for an operating system that they're not sure that they'll like. But I feel like dual booting just puts me in the place of somebody that's interested in art. So I had to use the CLI to select the areas of my drive. I wanted to install and partition them accordingly. Uh, I followed along a YouTube video for this. I'll leave it linked down below by KSK Roy. Uh, I had absolutely no hope here otherwise. I had to set up the EFI partition and the Linux file system partition myself and then I had to go into those partitions and create some directories for the install. And once that was all undone I typed arch install uh, to be greeted by the actual installer. I should note here that I'm on ethernet and if you're on wi-fi there is actually an extra step you have to do. If you're actually interested in doing this yourself, you'll find the extra step you need to do in the video that I linked down below. In the Arch install screen, you don't actually have to change much. I had to point the disk configuration to the partitions that I created earlier. I'm pretty sure that's something you only have to do if you're dual booting. I then configured my bootloader, which I picked Grub as I recognized it from my last time. It's basically the menu you see before your operating system. And in my case, it'll let me pick whether I want to boot into Arch or into Windows. 
Something really cool about Arc that I don't know if any other Linux distro has is I could pick my desktop environment right there before installing. I just went with KDE Plasma. It's the only one I actually kind of recognized from researching last video. Then I can pick my graphics card drivers in my machine back there. I've got a RTX 3070. Uh, so I went with the NVIDIA proprietary drivers, which worked fine. I didn't really need to do any extra setup to get those to work. I didn't really touch any other settings in the install besides applications. Uh, you can actually go through and pick from a list of stuff that you want to have pre-installed. If you want to have a browser installed, I recommend doing that here because Arch doesn't actually install one by default. Once that's all done, then just click the install button at the bottom and then let it do its thing. The last thing I had to actually do before going into my new OS, create a config file for the Grub bootloader. It was just copying a few commands from the video I was watching. And then I restarted my computer. Once my computer restarted, for the first time in this entire process, I was met with a graphical user interface. A GUI. Graphics. Linux users love their commands. Oh my god. So I just installed Arch. And then I used the GUI to go back into the terminal to do some more commands. I had to do a few more commands to get my Grub bootloader to recognize Windows. So Windows would show up as an option when I wanted to restart my computer. I was finally done after this. I was able to use the computer as a computer. All in all, it only took me, I'd say about an hour and a half to two hours from the point of downloading the ISO to getting to this point, which is actually a big improvement over my Ubuntu experience where Windows BitLocker made the process take over 20 hours. Even just at the start, there is no bloat whatsoever. I don't think I've ever had less installed by default on a fresh operating system than this. It doesn't even come with a browser, as I said before. I looked around and tweaked some things like uh, mouse sensitivity. Why even on Arch is mouse acceleration enabled by default? I feel like anybody that actually knows what that does just goes and disables it. I tried to install a global theme, but that kept having errors. And then at one point I got rate limited by the server. Even after I eventually got it to work, the theme did not look anywhere like the picture. I feel like I got catfished. I changed the whole system font to monospaces. I'm actually not really a huge fan of the default Linux font. One thing that's super nice is you can adjust the animation speed on a global scale. You can make everything instant if you'd like. You can slow down the animations if that's what you like. Personally, I just sped it up a little bit. I changed my taskbar to be on the top of the screen. Windows users can't even do that anymore. I installed some of the programs I use every day. So Node.js, uh, Cursor or VS Code, Discord, Spotify, all that stuff. I signed into all my accounts. And it was a nice experience. The snappiness of the OS rivals Mac OS, which for me is just the king of responsiveness and snappiness. Seriously, say what you will about Apple and you're probably right. Mac OS is just such a pleasure to use, honestly. I would highly recommend using Arch to any person interested in operating systems or any, per or any tinkerer. The satisfaction of seeing the GUI for the first time after installing was something that no other operating system has ever given me. So it's been a couple days, I've used it dual booted with Windows, and there are some things I've noticed that makes it a little bit irritating to use, and pretty much none of these are actually the fault of Arch. So whenever I'm using Arch and I boot back into Windows, Windows always initiates a disk repair every single time. What's funny is that it says to skip the disk repair, press any key on the keyboard, but the keyboard doesn't actually work. So it's kind of just like taunting you. Another thing that I thought I should note, if you play games, we all know many of the latest games don't work on Arch. Again, not Arch's fault, more the fault of developers or anti-cheat companies. Arch by default does not support secure boot. After researching, apparently you have to manually configure it after setup, which I didn't do. And I knew that actually going in, so I disabled secure boot before starting to install Arc. I went on Windows and tried to play some uh, Battlefield 6 and I was met with EA's anti-cheat, you must have secure boot enabled. So I was in this process where if I wanted to play some of my favorite games, I had to enable secure boot. And if I wanted to go back into Arch, I had to disable secure boot. To be fair, I probably could have set it up manually myself, but I just didn't get to that point. The developer experience for me on Arch was um, pretty similar. Uh, I use VS Code instead of like Vim or anything. So the developer experience is kind of the same no matter which operating system I use. The only noticeable improvement I found there was using Docker containers. Again, works much better on Linux. Would I daily drive Arch? You know, probably not. I would definitely keep it installed on my drive and continue messing around with it. But just too many of the things I use daily don't work on Arch. For example, occasionally I mess around with music and for that I use a program called Cubase. Cubase has no Linux version and it has some very heavy DRM protection. When you buy Cubase, the company actually sends you a USB licensor that you have to use. So trying to work around that with wine or something just wouldn't work. 
I recently did switch from Premiere Pro to DaVinci Resolve, which does have a Linux version, but after looking around online, it does lack some codec support. For example, it doesn't have any native H.265 or H.264 or AAC for audio. My favorite video games are usually competitive first person shooters, uh, Rainbow Six Siege, Call of Duty, Battlefield. Those are my favorite games that I play most of the time. And the games normally work fine, but the anti-cheat, which is, you know, what lets you play online, that does not work. I, you know, like most people, will probably be sticking to Windows, unfortunately, for desktop use, but I will be keeping a close eye on Linux. As like a lot of people, I really hope someday this friction switching over just goes away. You should subscribe because 99.8% uh, of people who watch are not subscribed. See ya.